evening. I am Diane Richards, director of the Harlem Writers Guild. You ha could have been many places tonight, but you've joined us and we want to thank you. On behalf of the Center for Black Literature and the Harlem Writers Guild, we welcome you to this evening's John Oliver Killens Reading Series program, Black Women Writers at Work, a Literary Salon. This evening's program is an official Brooklyn Book Festival bookend event, and we are delighted to be partnering with the center for this program. I wanna tell you a little bit about the Harlem Writers Guild. It was founded in 1950 in Harlem by John Oliver Killens, Rosa Gee, Dr. John Hendrick Clark and others. They held meetings in a building at 125th and Lenox Avenue in Harlem. Their primary purpose was to create literary works reflective of their lives and to level the playing field of publishing. Today, the Harlem Writers Guild is 70 years old and we carry on the serious legacy of supporting black writers. We know that the support of black writers for one another is unparalleled. For tonight's celebration of black women, Black women writers, Black women writers at work. Let's uplift a Black woman founder of the Harlem Writers Guild, Rosa Gee. Talk about a woman outnumbered by men. It was certainly Rosa Gee, and she was equal to the task. Think about it. She was in the company of John Oliver Killens, Dr. John Henry Clark, Ozzie Davis, Paul Robeson, Sidney Portier, and Harry Belafonte, James Baldwin, although he wasn't a member of the guild, he certainly came to guild meetings. She stood her ground as a black woman writer. I am so grateful that I met her. We stand on her shoulders and she attended Harlem Writers Guild's meetings for as long as she was with us. Rosa Gee and Maya Angelou were good friends and knew what Black sisterhood was all about. If you want to read Rosa Guy's work, her first novel was Bird at My Window, first published in 1966 during the heyday of the Black arts movement. Okay, so are you ready now? Let's listen carefully to these incredible Black women writers in our own literary salon. We're together now. We are creating a literary salon. Let's begin with Dr. Brenda Green. Dr. Brenda Green is a scholar, educational leader, author, literary activist, and radio host. She is professor of English, founder and executive director of the Center for Black Literature and director of the National Black Writers Conference at the Medgar Evers College CUNY. Her educational leadership, professional accomplishments and scholarship include essays, grants, book reviews and presentations in African American literature composition, and multicultural literature. She is editor of the African Presence and Influence on the Cultures of the Americas and co-editor of Resistance and Transformation, Conversations with Black Writers. Good evening, Dr. Green. Good evening, Diane. Thank you so much for that wonderful introduction. Thank you for upholding our writers, Rosa Gee and Maya Angelou. And thank you for sharing the background of the Harlem Writers Guild. And to our audience and our speakers, welcome Carla Holloway, Lady Hubbard, Mariah Yejeti, and Jennifer Baker. We are so pleased to be partnering with the Harlem Writers Guild and the Brooklyn Book Festival for this event. Welcome to the Megar Evers College community, our students, 
faculty, and staff, our CUNY community, our friends of Meg Rivers College, our Center for Black Literature board members, and our community partners. We have hundreds of registrants at this program, and we could not have done this without our program partners and supporters. They have helped us to create this magnificent event and a win-win situation for everyone. So I'd like to thank again, the Center for Law and Social Justice at Meg Rivers College, the Meg Rivers College Community Council, the Central Brooklyn Public Library, Dana Williams, for the, the Dean for the School of Liberal Arts at Howard University, Penn America, our program sponsor, the Amazon Literary Partnership, our bookseller, Troy Johnson of the African American Literature Book Club, who's carrying all of the books of our writers online. Make sure that you purchase them and support them. The Meg Rivers College Office of Communications, the Meg Rivers College Office of Academic Affairs. And of course, we could not do this without the Center for Black Literature staff and consultants. Clarence Reynolds, the director of the Center for Black Literature, Amber Magruder, the project manager, April Silver, the marketing and communications director, Leah Bird, the communications and marketing associate, Simone Wall Manning, our virtual events manager, Donna Hill, our fiction workshop leader and Brooklyn Public, Brooklyn Book Festival liaison. And I also like to acknowledge some of the writers who are, have, are attending this event. They are in the, they've registered and they've been part of programs at the Center for Black Literature. I hope that I'm not leaving some out, but I expect I will. So please let me apologize in advance. But Jeffrey Renard Allen, Todd Stephen Burroughs, Maya Leka Adiro, Lynn Fern Golevsky, Tina McElroy Anser, Robin Spencer, Donna Walker Kuhn, Cheryl Woodruff, and Jacqueline Johnson are just some of the few writers who are here with us today. We are pleased that the Center for Black Literature will be celebrating its 20th anniversary in 2022. We are committed to ensuring that the voices and writers of the African diaspora are sustained and promoted. We celebrate and acknowledge our writers through the National Black Writers Conference and Biennial Symposium, the John Alva Killens Reading Series, the Killens Review of Arts and Letters, our journal, the Dr. Edith Rock Writers Workshop for Elder Writers, and the Writers on Writing radio program, which airs on WMYE and is archived on our website on our YouTube pages. We also have a Center for Black Literature Book Club and Re-Envisioning Our Lives Through Literature, our youth program for our, our youth who are interested in writing and wanna make sure that they get and listen to the voices of our black writers. We also have a new addition, our student musings, our students from Meg Rivers College, our interns are writing and their voices and work are, um, are situated on our website. So I encourage you to visit the Center for Black Literature website to get more information. We are pleased this evening to hear from outstanding Black women writers. Each writer in telling her story takes us to the past while highlighting issues which continue to permeate our communities today. Using race, they, they race and immigration and um, the, the Jim Crow laws and citing writers from the Harlem Renaissance, they are taking us back. So I thank you once again for joining us and for your support. Your support um, incur is, is uh, a way to ensure that our books are sustained and our writers' voices are heard. So I encourage you to visit the African American Literary Book Club, um, AALBC. I think that is in the website. I encourage you all to donate to the Center for Black Literature. Your, no matter how small, help to sustain our program. And I wanna say no matter how small or how large, I don't want you to think it's how small. So stay tuned for a stimulating conversation 
with these writers who are taking our stories and sharing them in bold and imaginative ways. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Green. Now, I want to introduce you to our moderator for tonight's discussion, Jennifer Baker. Hi, Jennifer. Jennifer Baker is a publishing professional that everyone needs to know. Of almost 20 years, creator, host of the Minorities in Publishing podcast, and faculty member of the MFA program in creative nonfiction at Bay Path University. In 2019, she was named Publishers Weekly Superstar for her contributions to inclusion, thank you so much, and representation in publishing. Jennifer is also the editor of the BIPOC short story anthology, everybody listen carefully, Everyday People, The Color of Life, Atria Books 2018, and the author of the forthcoming novel, Forgive Me Not, Putnam, due in 2022. Her fiction, nonfiction, and criticism has appeared in various print and online publications. Her website is jennifernbaker.com. Now on to our featured writers tonight. Carla F.C. Holloway. Good evening, Carla. Good evening. I'm you really look beautiful. beautiful. You Thank look you. beautiful. Thank you for joining us tonight. Carla F.C. Holloway is James B. Duke Umerita at Duke University. Her debut novel, A Death in Harlem on Triquarterly Books was published in 2019, is a Harlem Renaissance mystery. Gone Missing in Harlem 2021 is a literary fiction about memory, mothering, and resilience set in the midst of the Harlem Renaissance and the Great Depression. And you know Black women needed all of that. They needed the memory, mothering, and resilience. <laughs> Weldon Thomas, New York City's first colored policeman, returns to the scene to resolve the mystery of a colored baby whose disappearance fails to attract the kind of attention focused on the Lindbergh kidnapping. BuzzFeed News has described gone missing as unputdownable. <laughs> Thank you, Carla, for joining us. Well, our, thanks for having me. Yes. And our next writer is Lady Hubbard. Hi, Lady. Hello. Hi. How are you? <laughs> Good. Lady is the author of The Rib King, published in 2021. Her novel, The Talented Ribkins, received the 2018 Ernest J. Gaines Award for Literary Excellence. Her writing has appeared in Guernica, The Times Literary Supplement, Arkansas International, Copper Nickel, and Callaloo, among other venues. She is recipient of a 2016 Rona Joff Foundation Writers Award and also received fellowships from Art Omi, the Sakatar Foundation, the Sustainable Arts Foundation, Hedgebrook, and the Virginia Center for the Creative Arts, among other places. Born in Massachusetts, and raised in the U.S. Virgin Islands in Florida. Hubbard currently lives, oh, I want to go, in New Orleans with her husband and three children. Oh, my goodness. That New Orleans yeah. is something, huh? That's, <laughs> that's rich with things to, to write about. It is. It is. <laughs> and our last writer is Maroa Yidade, a native of Washington, Maroa. Hi. Hello. Good evening. Good evening. 
You want to pronounce your last name so we all get it right. It's Yejide. Yejide. I Yejide. did it. I did it. Good, good. Maroa is a native of Washington, D.C., is the author of the critically acclaimed novel, Time of the Locust, which was a 2012 finalist for the Penn Bellwether Prize, long listed for the 2015 Penn Bingham Prize and a 2015 NAACP Image Award nominee. She lives in the DC area with her husband and three sons. Creatures of Passage is her second novel. We can't wait. Thank you. And now I'll turn this wonderful discussion over to Jennifer. Thank you so much, Diane. Thank you so much, Dr. Green, for introducing and Clarence for helping get us all together and everyone who's organized everything leading up to this moment right here. And especially thanks to Marora, uh, Carla, and Lady for coming from wherever y'all are coming from. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know where I am. So I don't know where. But we're going to have a really great discussion on craft. We're going to talk about the beauty of Blackness. We're gonna talk about you being just immensely talented individuals. And we're also gonna hear a little bit of everyone's work that we're, that we're blessed. And I just wanna congratulate y'all for finishing because that's hard in and of itself, each of these works. So I'm gonna ask questions. Some will be targeted to each uh, author. Some will be in general for all the authors to speak to. And also people are free to jump in. And then interspersed with that, we will hear about a two to three minute reading from each, starting with Carla. Um, but first, I'd love for y'all, for people who may not have read your works yet, to, can you give a brief summary? Sometimes I feel like that's so unfair to authors to say. So can you just kind of summarize your book for us? But I just like kind of give people an essence of what this discussion is in case they haven't read it. And people, you, again, you can also go and look up the books and see kind of like the wonderful jacket copy. So Marora, would you start us off with Preachers of Passage? Sure. Yeah, I agree with you. It's it's tough to do a summary, but Creatures of Passage is about a lot of things, but essentially it's about a family in Anacostia, which is a section of Washington, D.C. And our heroine in the story is um, a cab driver. She's like a makeshift cab driver. Her name is Nephthys Kenwell. And she ferries uh, passengers or souls throughout the city. Um, her family is at a critical point um, because her great nephew um, has witnessed something and I won't give spoilers, but what he's seen has um, changed pretty much everything and then he becomes a target. And so it's about saving this boy. Um, mm -hmm. It's about um, generations coming together and uh, sort of saving the future as simplified uh, with this boy. And now I have a follow-up question, but I'm gonna hold that <laughs> in regards to what you just said about saving a boy of uh, being at the center of this. And so Lady, could you try to summarize the Rip King? <laughs> yeah, yeah, sure. Um, it is set in a Chicago-ish city that isn't actually named in the early 20th century. And it's the, um, the story of uh, an African-American man who works for a wealthy white family called the Barclays. And he um, creates a meat sauce uh, that is eventually receives national distribution and is sold with a, a caricature of his face on the label. And it becomes extremely popular and makes a lot of money, but he doesn't get any of the profits and he spends the rest of his life touring the country as the, um, the rib king. Um, also, uh, before he wound up working in this house, he was um, part of, a, of an all black community that was destroyed or, or yeah, that was completely destroyed. He thinks he's the only survivor of this community that was uh, sort of, it was taken out by racial violence like uh, following the reconstruction, there's a lot of 
incidents that it was based on that I did that. It happened in a lot of different places. Um, so he is actually using the mask of, of the Rib King and the tour as a pretense to um, sort of um, ex ex exact revenge on the, the people that he thinks destroyed his community. So that's the first half of the book. And the second half of the book is told from the perspective of a woman who was a maid in the house, the Barclays house, before he became the Rib King. And she's sort of dealing with the, the fallout um, the repercussions of his literal violence and also the um, symbolic violence of, of his image as, as a, it, he's sort of a minstrel figure. So that's basically what it's about. And Carla, can you tell us a little bit about Gone Missing in Harlem? And that would be a great segue into your reading. Yeah, I'm delighted to share Gone Missing in Harlem. And I thought I'd actually read from the beginning of the book, although it's definitely related to this first book, um, A Death in Harlem. And the story just kept going for me with this first colored policeman in Harlem and the kinds of things he would have to experience. But this book, and I was so glad you said it's focus on motherhood and um, remembering and the choices that we make for our children because although the first colored policeman is there to figure out what happens if a baby in Harlem goes missing around the same time that the Lindbergh baby was kidnapped and that was my takeoff for the story because I kept thinking yeah but if it was one of ours and you can see from what's going on today what happens when black folks go missing um, the story actually begins with the 1918 flu pandemic. Um, who knew? I did not know at that time. Um, and then travels through back into Sedalia, North Carolina, up into Harlem's New York City. So it's a traveling story, but the consistency is motherhood, grief, and resilience, and the kinds of acts we are forced into as mothers, and the kinds of um, the kinds of tragedies our children endure that we might not quite understand. So I'm just going to go on and start reading from the beginning. Um, the first chapter is called My Baby Gone. Baby Chloe was alone for only a snatch of a moment, which some said was just long enough for exactly that when her mother went inside Chasen's groceries to pay for the apples she selected from the front window bin. It was mid-autumn. Some leaves had already turned, distancing themselves from the summer's green. A quiet morning light scattered through the leafy filter of the chestnut's canopy at the corner and unabashedly took up the gilded promise of the next season's colors. Despite the disarray to come, the day would be brisk and bright. Somebody, likely the boy Chasen hired to do the toting from the basement storage and sweet floors inside and at the store's front door, had meticulously stacked the apples into golden, then green, then crimson, leading to striated shades of red, a pyramid that rose to a peak right under the window. A gilded and black edged calligraphy scrolled the grocer's name across the glass. A mix of other produce, pears, carrots, and tomatoes, red and yellow onions both, latticed ba baskets of tomatoes still attached to their tangle of vines, and mounds of string beans ready to be grabbed up by the handfuls, lay in a sc haphazard scatter across a hodgepodge of wooden crates. Only the apples were arranged, daring someone to break into the rising display. Selma Mosby did exactly that. With each grasp of the round, firm fruit, she got closer to her memory of skillet fried apples simmered down into a buttery sweet nectar with more than enough vanilla and nutmeg sprinkled through. Selma thought that if she repeated the childhood memory exactly right, she might come closer to being cherished like her brother Junebug had been. 
Selma had the moment fully fleshed out in what was left of her mind when she tried to maneuver the baby's flashy modern pram into the grocery, but its wide wheel carriage wouldn't make it down the aisle, so she backed the buggy outside the door and left it lined up against the bin that held the yams. It wouldn't take long to ring up the apples and pull some stick cinnamon from the counter jar. She wouldn't be gone for more than a minute. That much was correct. Selma was gone for not long at all, but the same would not be true for baby Chloe. The not much older than a girl her own self left her daughter's carriage outside and stepped into the small neighborhood gathered inside Chasen's. She didn't notice the white man on the corner leaned against the street lamp pretending to read the folded newspaper. A burlap sack was rolled and tucked up under his arm. He was probably no older than 30, even though his pockmarked cheeks made him look older. He had tortoise-shelled horned rims and wore a brown fedora. And more often than looking down at the paper, he looked up and around, surveying the street and especially watching the grocery store on the corner. Selma needed to be her mama's baby again. So she wasn't paying one bit of attention when Mrs. Ada Chasen followed her out in order to get her peek at her newborn. The grocer's wife watched while Selma bent over to place the brown paper bag into the pram. Neither of them stopped to notice the street's unusual quiet. Even the white man had disappeared from his vigil at the lamp post. Selma laid the lumpy bag right on top of the baby's blanket, folding the top over on itself so the apples wouldn't tumble out. But it wouldn't have mattered if they had. There was nothing else there. No not yet turned dusky cheeked child, no grasping fingers baby, no rose lipped infant. With Mrs. Chasen standing next to her trying desperately to understand why she saw nothing in the buggy but a bulging brown back paper bag full of apples, Selma looked up and then over at the elderly woman and finally took in her worried look. She twisted sharply from one side to the other and not seeing what she expected, took in some air, the last full and deliberate deep breath she remembered and said what she did. Mrs. Chasen's wail nearly drowned out Selma's soft question. Is, she whispered her confusion, my baby gone? My baby gone missing? <laughs> it's so interesting to hear it after reading that portion too so thank you so much Carla mm -hmm. and it's interesting because everyone has spoken about elements that I feel like if aren't like aren't concretely juxtaposed against stuff that actually happened you do really utilize and materialize that in your respective works of what has occurred to black people over yeah. time while also making your characters distinctive. And so my first question is how do, how do you as artists and, and, and some of your teachers as well and, and readers, like how do you see truth and fiction coming together? Uh, and you could speak to it in any way that it moves you, but since this is the writer series, perhaps you wanna tackle that in regards to the works that we're talking about today. I'll ask Lady, do you want to start? I've got to kind of pick people because sometimes it gets really awkward and we're not in the same space, right? So I'll just stare right. at you and you'll stare at me. So let's not do that. So <laughs> yeah, well, it's interesting in terms of history. Uh, well, this is one way that it's interesting is because um, so much of, of, of Black history or the truth of, of the Black experience is not documented, right? So it's the way, you know, so you, you hear it through stories and things like that. So that uh, is actually part of what the book is about is the difference between sort of the documented history, this is the truth. And then there's all these things that aren't, can't be proven, which is why I think for me is part of the, I'm sure it's true of other writers as well as part of the, um, there's like a appeal or a need even to, to fill in a lot of blank spaces. With, with, I imagine my own truth. Do you know what I mean? So you can't really, there are things you cannot find um, outside of fiction because they're not documented in that way. So that's that's one thing I think about when, especially with um, 
um, historical fiction, right? Um, because a lot of people's histories and the truth is not really documented. The only way to access it is to create it, recreate it, reconstruct it, and imagine it. Um, so that's one thing. And then also, I, I, I think that um, it, it, to a certain extent, that's always true with, with fiction, or at least it is for, for me. It's trying to find um, or express a way to express like my own truth. Right. So fiction is truth to me, is what I mean. <laughs> Maroa, do you have? Well, I think um, for the African American experience, you know, it's very generational. Time is really a character in our lives. And so I use that a lot in, in my storytelling. Um, I think because of the trauma and the issues that we've had to uh, contest with from one generation to the next, you know, I choose to use magical realism um, as a way to convey um, some of the very real terrors that we live, but also the triumphs um, that we're able to um, accomplish and the things that we're able to do in spite of um, things that um, that we're faced with. I think our fiction, you know, to really do it justice, you know, we, we have to span um, the, you know, the, the entire spectrum of storytelling. So I usually try to paint as vivid a picture uh, as possible through fiction um, of uh, the Black men and the Black women um, who have, uh, who are living their lives um, in the United States and how um, our history impacts us long before we're born. Um, you know, I think a lot of, um, you know, sort of the magic for the way we tell our stories has to do with how history impacts us and how the future also is waiting for us to write it. And so, um, yeah, I think it's a it's sort of an unbroken chain, but it's our responsibility as Black writers to really do our stories justice, um, I believe, and to tell them and it's in tell those stories in their fullest complexity as possible, so that we don't fall into the trap of just talking about what happened but why something happened. Because um, really that's the crux of it uh, for us, um, why we're in the state that we're in, what choices we can make, what are our reasons for those choices going forward. So those are some of the things that, that come to mind. Thank you, and Carla? I was so happy to hear the word complexity come in and you know, looking for truth. For, for me personally, I discover the truth as I'm writing. I don't go in thinking, this is what's so, but the story does sort of reveal itself. But what has been also important is that we are a complex people with extraordinary imagination and history. And what happens when you are a writer and pay close attention to that? Well, there is black joy and black sorrow in the same moment. There is a very flawed black mother in my book who finds a way to make a plan, partially because the ghost of her husband shows up and says, make a plan, baby. But this idea that we are always spoken to by our histories, whether they are ancestral figures, whether it is magical realism, we live in a time that incorporates both the before and the after. And that expectation that there will be an after certainly drove this book, Gone Missing in Harlem, certainly drove the idea of what happens when a baby goes missing. Well, the expectation of resilience can be both a disease of strength, but it can also propel one to do what's necessary in the moment. And when I write and find my characters in those moments that seem irredeemable, I know that um, if I keep writing, they will find their way through. Um, they might have a guide, um, a spirit guide. They might have my grandmother's voice in my head coming out on the page. Um, they might have the name of a relative who spoke to me in a way that gave me 
the kind of resilience I needed. But I like the idea of, you know, after years of teaching, it's a fiction folk. When I started writing it after I retired, I realized this is all our lives and our imaginary are as full and credible and usable in our lives as those facts represented, sometimes not by our own folk. Absolutely, absolutely. And we're gonna transition into ladies reading because at about 7.40, we're gonna open it up for Q&A. So if you have questions, please put them in the Q&A, not necessarily the chat in itself. You may still do that. You have time to make a change, <laughs> put it in the Q&A. And in the meantime, really happy to hear a bit from the Rib King. Yeah. Um, so I was gonna, um, I'll just read part of the, the third chapter. So another thing that um, is going on because in the book, it, you, you don't get a sense of it in the description at all is that um, the whole time this man is turning into the rib king. He, he's really trying to preserve the lives of these three, there are three orphan boys that work in the house. So it's really about him trying to be a caregiver to them. So this, this chapter is, uh, one of them is, has gone missing and he, he realizes that um, he was uh, arrested at the fair. So this is him going to, to find him. Uh, Mr. Sitwell hurried through the garden and out the gate, headed toward the omnibus stop. As he ran, he thought about all the other orphans he'd known over the years, boys caught stealing and sent away, never to be heard from again. So many boys had come and gone since he'd started working in that house that he couldn't even recall most of their names. Their features blurred and blended in Sitwell's mind so that they all seemed sad semblances of the two who'd stood beside him on the back porch the day he arrived. Those boys had only lasted a few months before they were sent back to the asylum for stealing silverware and ever after that theft was how Mr. Sitwell knew that deep down he was still one of them. Because the truth was, when those two others were banished from the house, Mr. Sitwell had been stealing too. Somehow he just managed not to get caught. For the next 20 years, he'd worked in that house and never once thought to intervene. Yet here he was running. What was it that made these boys different? What was it that made him run? All he could think was that it had something to do with Mr. Barclay asking him to choose between them, that somehow it had had the effect of making him feel responsible for them, accountable not only for the answer he had come up with, but also for his own determination not to give it. The bus pulled to the curb. He climbed aboard a crowded car and found himself wedged between two men in sanitation uniforms. He paid his fare, pushed past the men, and stood near a group of women in frock coats arguing in some Slavic language. The driver yelled, push back, and Mr. Sitwell took a few more steps towards the rear of the car. He stopped next to a heavy set man in a blue fedora. He reached for the handrail and looked down at the elderly woman in the seat in front of him, humming to herself with her eyes closed. The car lurched and rumbled down Oleana Avenue, then rounded a corner headed past the magazine. He climbed down near the park and made his way through the remnants of the fairgrounds. During the ex exposition, it was estimated that more than 1 million people had come to the city to see the fair, but there wasn't much to look at anymore. The entire exposition had been conceptualized as an object lesson for the the modern worker, meant to demonstrate the many marvels of capitalism, a display of the collective fruits of industrial labor. Its actual, cons its actual construction had involved five years of brutal backbreaking work on the part of hundreds of men tasked with the arduous job of clearing an entire swamp. Several had died in the process, and for most of the survivors, the glories of the fair had not proved sufficient compensation. Much of it had been reduced to cinders not a year after the exposition closed, a casualty of a worker's strike. Thanks so much, lady. 
And I think it's interesting, I'm, I'm gonna add a question here. Everyone spoke about kind of, if not maternity, paternity as well, because Mr. Sitwell kind of takes on these boys in a way in the Rip King. And then you have the generational aspects of what's going on in both Carla's books, as well as Moroa's um, in, in your respective books. And then Moroa, we actually hear from the child as well mm -hmm. in Creatures of Passage. So I'm very curious about the approach to that for each of you in these, in these books. And, and I don't know if that was well planned by Clarence in terms of not just kind of like thematic overlap in some ways, as well as the uniqueness of each of the stories. But I came away from each of your books really thinking a lot about guardianship and mm. community, yeah. uh, especially like in Creatures of Passage, like how the community kind of comes together at the end and with the Rib King where like there's kind of even those breaks in community, like the it's kind of starts that way and then it kind of ends that way. And Carla, in your book, it's like how it's there's an aim to maintain that mm. community, and sometimes it keeps getting pulled apart by circumstances not beyond our control. Uh, and so, can you? I think that was a very broad question, <laughs> but I, I'm just so interested in how caregiving and, and like guardianship kind of works because I think especially as a black woman who's very much raised by many women in her family uh, the importance of that and how I think as children I didn't as a child I didn't understand it and as an adult I, I recognize the importance of it for the sustainability of our culture yeah. right and, and that is so present to me in each of your books and so I don't know if you even realize that when you, were, when, you were, when you were writing books and actually having like the biological parents or, you know, the spouses or just, again, the community coming together. Like how important did you feel that was for each of your books? And I don't know if a lady you would want to start that one. Do you, because you, do you mean the community, the role of community? Yeah, the role of community, because it is biological as well as made, right? It's right. Not Shows yeah, there's very little actually biological community in the, it's all made community. That's that's very interesting. I don't know if I, because you started out, you were asking about just caregiving um, in particular, and that that was really where the, the impetus for the whole um, book came was, it, it was a, a manifestation. I was very, um, there was, uh, I was interested in writing about the vulnerability of African-American children to violence, to racial violence in the present. And it sort of turned into a historic fiction because it, 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 it seems to be something that has sustained itself mm -hmm. as much as things have changed over the past hundred years. There's still that the kind of anxiety that um, you know eventually starts to really wear down um, Mr. Sitwell his mind, right? So he tries everything. So that's really interesting. And all most of these communities in the in the book specifically are made. And I think that is really a crucial part of what um, both Mr. Sitwell, the Rib King, and Jenny in the second half of the book are trying to do is, is create um, community. Does that make sense? It's like a way of coming together. Yes. And I don't think they're fully conscious of that. So that's why that's interesting because it almost seems like inherent to, to the gesture of trying to protect the people that are dependent on them is them all sort of coming together and working together. So yeah, that was not the first thing that was on my mind when I was writing about it, but it, it's true because you, you just mentioned it. It's sort of like part of the same gesture. They're inherently connected. And Carla, in your work, you know, those initial images of children and trying to protect children in the first few chapters and, and, and how building a family is so important, especially to Delilah mm -hmm. uh, in, in that respect. And so was that pretty heavy on your mind in terms of looking at how things unravel for a family and the effects of that? It absolutely was. And, and Delilah is a flawed mother, which, I learned from my own flawed mothering. Um, but one of the things that was important in this sense of how she was going to survive herself, and also to make very clear that, you know, her mistakes as a mother were not intent. She, she did her best, you know, um, and doing her best in a world that is, is 
somehow formulated to work against you sometimes isn't quite enough. There's a scene in the book early on after Selma's baby goes missing um, and she just had to be caught. I don't know why she's Selma. I, my, my family comes from Selma, Alabama and I thought somebody lovely needs to be named Selma. So I chose the name Selma and when before her mother shows up she's surrounded in the back of the grocery store with a community of women who are brushing her hair and giving her milk tea um, which you know, people used to give you when you needed something and they couldn't put a little taste of something in it, um, surrounding her, making sure she was warm. I had a moment like that in my own life and it was actually my book club that mm -hmm. came in a moment of extraordinary trauma, showed up before anybody else did and was there brushing my hair, surround, answering the phone. So this idea of Black women forming necessary spaces to save ourselves and eventually to save our children was very much not only a part of my experience, but a part of my want to tell about, um, you know, there's, there's plenty of Black joy, there's plenty of Black complication, but the resilience and the effort mattered to me. And I wanted to see, well, what happens when it matters even though things are stacked against you. And so what threads the novel is these communities, even when they are quite ugly, because somebody said, well, who's the baby's daddy? And the baby ain't got no daddy, oh, price drop. You know, so the community also talks about you, given the opportunity to talk about you. you know, so community isn't always so affirming, but when necessary, in those moments of the deepest trauma, that's what organically forms amongst Black folks, I think, in ways that makes these generational stories possible. Otherwise, I don't think we'd be here being able to relate, oh yeah, I knew back in the, I can say back in the 50s, um, and some people can say back in the 80s when this happened, and church women whose job this is to you know, put on those church shoes and go down to somebody's house and take care of the business. So this is something unique in our African-American experience that I wanted to elevate to intentionality in this story. Does that make sense? Absolutely, absolutely. And Maroa, uh, you as well, that can lead into your wonderful reading of Creatures of Passage. Sure. I, I think for me, um, you know, we're reflections of each other, Black men and Black women. And you, you really, in my view, cannot tell one story without the other. Um, you know, in Creatures of Passage, I can't really tell um, the boy's mom's story without telling the boy's father's story, because they're both, they each are part, part of the coin and what um, impacts this child's life and what eventually um, sets his future uh, in motion. I think generationally, um, you know, as a community, as historically as, um, you know, from the ship to the United States, you know, we came here together. We didn't come here separately, you know, black women on one boat and black men on another boat. We came here together. And so that's part of that complexity that I try to reflect um, in my storytelling um, in, in the sense that there may be an absence, but that absence is part of the story. There's a reason for that absence and also a returning um, into uh, the child's life um, for um, particular reasons in the story. But I think that, um, you know, for me, it's important to, um, share as much of the depth of a community as possible in all of its flaws and all of its beauty. And I think um, in that way, it helps me to understand um, uh, our story uh, a little bit better. You know, in my own family, my father was, you know, and still remains, you know, my hero. He was constantly in my ear, you know, telling me from, you know, the youngest age, you know, you can do anything you can be anything. You know, my mother was telling me the same thing. They had different perspectives on the same thing. And then as parents, you know, I don't have little kids anymore. My husband and I, they're all in college now, but, you know, they, 
it, I have a perspective on how things should be handled and their father has a perspective. I can't tell them um, from a male's point of view how they should do a certain thing. I can tell them from my experience and likewise um, with their father. So it's just a part of, um, you know, those elements have always been there, I, I believe, in our lives. It's just that because of of white supremacy and because of the historical trauma that we've been faced with, many of those things have been um, crippled or dysfunctioned or transitioned into something else. But um, that's kind of my take on it. I'll just read from the very beginning of the book because it sets, sets the tone for the story. Nephthys Kenwell is not a savior of souls. That was God's charge, or maybe the trade of the devil. But she did ferry souls from one quadrant to another, and over the streets that now covered the prehistoric marshes of the capital of the territories. There was a certain geography to it all she'd learned, to the win-lose draw of lives. For, Ke for Nephthys Kenwell knew, as all wandering hearts do, that it was not enough to know where things happened in the lines and circles of human lives, but why? Since the reasons for happenings were buried much deeper than the happenings themselves. So she never had to look for the signs, omens, bones of creatures of passage. They found her. The kingdoms of the land that together made the United Territories had just turned 200 years old the summer before a fledgling in the long line of empires risen and fallen. But in 1977, Anacostia was still the new world, an isle of blood and desire. It was the capital's wild child east of a river that bore its name, a place where much was yet discovered. Anything was possible in that easternmost quadrant where all things lived and died on the edges of, edges of time and space in meaning. It was a realm of contradictions, an undulating landscape of pristine land and dirty water, of breathtaking hills and decimated valleys. Crab apple and cherry trees flourished in the yards of abandoned houses, and centuries old oaks flanked rundown corner stores. Pushers stood watch for cars when little kids were crossing the street, and junkies held doors open for old women. Or old men played basketball and chess with fatherless boys. The unemployed sat in windows and kept tabs on the injustices of the land. I'll tell your mama was the universal threat because next to God, there was none more powerful. So that the damnation and glory of man was forever intertwined in Anacostia since all who lived there were faced with the unconquerable presence of both. The mechanics of rule and office and Congress and the four-year-old District of Columbia Council was all a vast gray mass glimpsed across the water. Fairfax, Arlington, Montgomery and Prince George's fiefdoms were distant domains. The triumvirate of the White House and the Lincoln Memorial and the Washington Monument stood alabaster and resolute and like the Acropolis, held great dominion. But their reach was hardly felt in that east of the river realm where people lived a reality that was and was not of their own making, where dreams came true, even when people didn't want them to. <laughs> Sorry, the unmute thing. That was great. Thank you so much. Thank you all so much for taking the time to, to let us hear the work. It's so wonderful, again, to hear your voices associated uh, with the writing in itself. And also, because it's weird, again, being online, and I feel like you don't get the same energy, I want to just say some of the comments have been incredibly thoughtful, and that Maroa, your former editor, Malaika, said she's super proud of you. <laughs> and uh, so many people thank you Carla for the reading of the first passage because they felt it and there are many many fans who have the Rip King on their list and can't wait to read it even more now after hearing it 
Um, so I just wanted to give all that positive energy that's going on in the chat to each of you. Um, and thank you all so much again. So Maroa, there was, I don't know why I'm stuck on this, but like when I, I love reading acknowledgement pages and just seeing like whether the stress of the book is fully like, encompassed in that moment where the author is just like, I'm so glad it's over. Here's a list of everyone who called me and, and sent me flowers and, and validated me, even though this book almost never got done. Thank you. And please pay me <laughs> at this point. And you had talked about, you know, how the expansiveness of this book uh, was a lot to do, <laughs> to deal with, and, and how an idea can be so hard to kind of formulate. Uh, and I'm not sure how this started, because this is a question actually for all of you. With Creatures of Passage, there are so many voices uh, within the book. We have Osiris, we have Amber, uh, we have Nephthys, and, and then we, we learn hear from other people, especially like the villain uh, of the story as well. And I don't know if it started out that way. Did it kind of start kind of singularly for you of this is a story about a family or this is Nephthys' story and Osiris' story, and actually it is having a snowball effect now that I'm putting it onto the page. Well, yeah, I think um, I tend to write organically. I wrote Creatures of Passage over many years, about 17 years. And um, oh, I, took, wow. like, I took a coffee break to, to write Time of the Locust and then continue on writing. But um, I think, um, you know, our youngest boy is the clock. We call him the clock and we call Creatures of Passage, you know, are the fourth child because it's grown with me over, over the years and it's, I've watched Washington DC morph. Um, so it's very much, it's very much been like, um, you know, a, a growth process, a, a garden even, you know, where, you know, you plant things and tend things and it grows and grows and grows. But the seed of it came, I think, from the, my grandmother who was a DC cab driver um, back in the late 50s, early 60s. And, you know, like many Black Washingtonians, she held many jobs and did a lot of things uh, to support her family, uh, faced a lot of trials and tribulations. And, you know, she didn't talk a whole lot about her, her life. She was so busy taking care of everyone else. So, you know, I, I think um, many of my uh, writings, including Creatures of Passage, starts with a question. What was that like for her? You know, um, and I wondered about the people who got into her car. So that was probably the seed um, where Creatures of Passage grew from and um, really looking at time as a currency, you know, what happened in my grandmother's generation is impacting my generation. What happens in my generation is impacting my son's generations um, and, and how they'll live their lives. And, you know, and the irony of black people in the United States, especially having to um, be born into circumstances that, uh, you know, ripple effect that started long before they were born. But the question always remains, what are we going to do about it? I think each generation has that task, has that challenge. So Creatures of Passage is, is a story of a family at the center. Um, and it's about our greatness. You know, I, I grew up in, in new people, relatives and aunties who, you know, they were superhuman and what, to me anyway, and to what they were able to, to accomplish, you know, uncles who were able to, you know, knock down mountains, you know, my father, you know, is like Mount Everest to me and still is, you know, based when you sit and listen to what they've had to go through. So, you know, it's, the book is a, is a take on capturing um, the majesty, the horror, and and the commitment and will to continue on. And piggybacking off of that, Carla, you mentioned about female community and how important that was. And then you have Gone Missing in Harlem, but preceding that you have Death in Harlem too. And, and I'm curious about how time plays a big role. I mean, time plays a role in everyone's work, but especially you having done those two books like, was that something that was very, very purposeful and something you're being super conscious of in the writing as it's going along? Because for some people that could kind of inhibit them is, oh, I have to maintain the accuracy, which is important, 
but it, it might kind of detract from understanding your characters. And I don't know if that is part of your process or not. Accuracy is not part of my process. It's <laughs> fiction. <laughs> that, that, that's my excuse. It's a fiction. But there were things I needed to order correctly. The, the, pan, the Spanish flu, um, the, the Harlem Renaissance followed by the, I mean, preceded by the Great Migration, followed by the Depression. I had to figure out when the Lindbergh baby kidnapping took place and how I could work this story into that. So there was research in the sense of I wanted to be not so far off the beaten path that people would recognize it. But at the same time, what I considered my playfulness and ability to manipulate time, place, space, and everybody in between, um, which some reviewers have taken as the fatal flaw, is my enjoyment of fiction. It's what it's, you know, I, I call this period of my life, I have been loosed into fiction and, and freed into its um, lack of the borders and frames of the life that I led before this. And I was so glad to hear more uh, talk about 17 years because I started writing both of these books in around 2007. And I would go back from one to the other. Um, so people think, yep, she retired in 2016 and two years later she had a book. It wasn't like that at all. My head has been in the fiction, especially since I've been a teacher of it for a while. And I wanted to maintain both the freedom of voice, the freedom of any anybody who wanted to talk, including the streets of Harlem, would show up with a voice in a death in Harlem. Harlem has a voice, why not? You know, it's been there forever. It would have a perspective. And since I write literally at night when it's dark and I need the dark to write, um, I do hear, there are folks talking, you know, the, that's when my brother-in-law from Nigeria would say, if you go to sleep, that's when the ancestors will tell you what to do. Actually, I use that line in one of the books, um, but hearing from the dark and being able to put that into some kind of, I hope, coherent story has been just the, the joy of writing. So I'm, finding I'm actually working on a book in my head that's um, that might be the third book but I feel like somebody tied me so tightly to this mystery genre and that feels uncomfortable but it's about an elderly psychic in Harlem who has dementia and wouldn't that be interesting for a psychic who's supposed to be responsible for telling you what to do in your life is also suffering from dementia and yes, this is related to the fact that I'm now 72 years old and not remembering things the same well, but A Haunting in Harlem, which is my idea for this book, will probably take another 10 years and hopefully keep me alive. But I want that freedom of play. And I want all those things that more of us spoke of, the, the joy, the challenge, the resistance, the resilience, the horror, that exists literally, quite literally in the same space to be workable as, um, not as plot, but as event. And so when there's a horror, there might also be somebody telling you how to deal with it. They might be totally wrong, but somebody's got some advice. Yeah, so I wanted to embrace that, um, what I think fiction is, and that's the, the expectation that you are loosed. Mm. Dave. Dave. And Lady, I'm curious, because you mentioned about the children and, and kind of the seed of the Rib King itself, but then there's that kind of bifurcation point because we have those two very differing points of views of characters that we've seen in both instances, but then once we move 10 years into the future and, and we're with Jenny and no longer Mr. Sitwell, I, I was just like really intrigued about that shift. So can you talk a little bit about that? 
Yeah. Um, so in my mind, the, the, there's two sections. One is from Mr. Silva, one is from Ginny. And there's a lot of, um, while for writing it, I don't know, it's probably different reading it, but for writing it, it, it's sort of the same story for me towards twice. It's like the same dynamics. They're actually both people that have had horribly traumatic childhoods, right? And they're both trying to be caregivers and they have really different responses to what were in my mind sort of similar pressures. And I, I, I did that in a sense, because I kind of feel like the, there's a, a much more linear progression with Mr. Sitwell. And it's very, it's, it's sort of towards nihilism. But I, I, I really don't think that that was like an accurate, um, you're talking about an African-American uh, community as something that's sustaining. Um, I wanted to show the other side. So to me, it's like they're they're telling the same story, but they're also in dialogue with each other because their reactions are so different, the characters. Does that make sense? So that's why there is that bifurcation. And also because they are, for me, so thematically similar, I wanted to make the the sort of the narrative structure, the voice, very different, which maybe makes it less noticeable that they they are actually very similar stories. Do you know what I mean? I didn't want to just be saying, here's one story, here's the exact same story. I'm telling you it twice. It's like, it's different and that affects the, the, the narrative structure as well. And I also think Mr. the Sitwell section has, there's much more, it's sort of a much more logical than, than Jenny's because hers is much more, um, I don't know, I think you have to sort of transcend um, being realistic. Um, I do think that's part of um, how people have survived as well. Like someone saying, because it, it just, sometimes this, it doesn't make sense that, that people have survived and not just survived, but produced so much sort of beauty and, um, and innovation, right? when no one expected them to, and you're constantly being told you're, you're not capable of it and it's not possible. And then you do have people that like Jenny, who I think are, are sort of un, inherently unrealistic people, which at the same time is, is the same thing as saying they are not going to be stopped by obstacles that other people put in front of them. They're gonna find a way to keep going. So I, I feel like both of the, it's, it's sort of reflected in, in a lot of different ways in the two. Yeah. Does that make sense what I'm saying? Yes. <laughs> you make sense, lady. Yeah, I know it's late. <laughs> it's very sense. late here. Very late here. So I'm trying. <laughs> so the Q&A has been busy. So y'all's got to work. I appreciate that. Um, so I'm going to start tapping into this now that it is officially 740 my time Eastern, and I'm going to start with the question. What advice do any of the panelists have for new writers just starting out? What is your advice about going about getting their work in the hands of readers? Does anyone have any advice to newbies? <clears throat> I guess I could share a little bit. Um, and, you know, publishing is such a subjective business. Reading is subjective as well. So, you know, everyone has their own path. You know, what, what one writer did is not going to be the same um, for you. I think um, stay in the cockpit of your own writing career. Look at um, the direction that you want to go. Editors that may um, have interest in, in your type of work, publishing houses that may have interest in your type of work. And all of those things are legwork type of things that you don't have a whole lot of control over. But you can put your work out there. But you know, as long as you focus on doing the best possible product that you feel that you can do for your uh, work, you, you really can't worry about the, the rest. Um, you know, there's no magic bullet. There's really no formula. Some people say get an agent. I've never had an agent. I still don't have an agent and don't want an agent um, just because, you know, I, I tend to, you know, pilot, like to pilot things myself. But 
everyone has their own way of, of going about it. But as a debut writer, I would say, go full in, go hard on making your, your uh, product, your story as polished as possible. And then just keep going until, you know, I, my strategy was keep going until I get a yes. So, you know, you know. Get, get 70 mm -hmm. no's, you only need one yes. <laughs> <laughs> Let me say that um, I agree with so much of what you just said. And one of the things that probably because of the, the years in the academy, it ended up being just happenstance that I went with a university press. Once I found out, you know, for years I had been publishing nonfiction, the serious nonfiction. They, you know, passed on the story of, of African-American funeral homes or bioethics books or law books. And at one point, Northwestern sent me something about their Harlem Renaissance collection. And I said, what? University Press published fiction? And since that was such a com comfortable space for me anyway, I queried them directly, you know, with unagented, I hear is, is my word, um, and got the most familiar response, a group of readers who were interested in the product, who would be careful with it, who respected my background and also knew the assist I needed to turn into. Uh, Tri-Quarterly Press is a, is a, um, a fact, a, a piece of, this is where I lose my words, of Northwestern University Press. But Tricorderly publishes poetry and fiction and does such a beautiful job with it. And I felt to home there. Now, some people want that big New York publisher that's going to get you in, uh, in all the book clubs. Um, when I got the thrilling part when I wrote um, A Death in Harlem and I got a note from AALBC being interested in doing an interview and the book, I, I had made it, you know, my readers who would read African-American literature. So the AALBC um, books were there and they made certain that I knew they were there. And so I think it's important to keep, and this is what I used to tell students, keep your audience in mind. If we know we are also not writing for ourselves, we're also not writing for everybody in the world. So if you have a sense of who your readers are, mine were always my book club. I had to write a book that my book club would agree to put on the book club's list. And both my um, co-panelist books are on my book club's list and have been. But the idea that um, I had to have some of this in it and some of that or else somebody wasn't gonna read. And some of those names in the book are book club names, you know, but we have old school names, so they worked. So my readers were my book club and, I, and we're 35 years old. So we've been reading quite a while. So keep a sense of audience in mind. That's the short version. I'm gonna to move to the next question. Um, my questions to the author are how do you start uh, what is your trigger for the work and how do you finish? How do you know when you're finished? Yeah, that was a lot. So basically, where do you start or, or what kind of motivates you to get the work going and how do you get to the finish line is what I'm guessing. Um, so I don't know, if, lady, you didn't get the answer to the last one. Would you like to jump in on this one? Okay, if you don't want to. Sure, no, that's fine. They, they're all, for me, they're all um, very, um, different projects so they all start from something very and I think Carla mentioned this before like so part of writing is to figure out what you think so I sometimes I feel like I'm trying to formulate a question I'm trying there's something that I'm very moved by or concerned with and I'm trying to find a way to express it and that's what the the book is so the the talented rib king had was about is really about my grandfather and my relationship to my grandfather and all of these other things kind of came out of that and the rib king is is something else and yeah so that's it's it, it's something inside of me I mean I'm usually not trying to um it's not very strategic <laughs> in my approach so it's all very internal yeah 
Is that was that the question? Yeah. Yeah, I think okay. so. I don't know if anyone else wants to answer. Yeah, Sorry. I want to say because, and this can be quick. Um, multi genre. I saw a picture in the New York Times when I was researching a book on um, bioethics about the Lindbergh kidnapping. And the photograph on the front page of the New York Times, 19, mid 1930s, was the Lindbergh baby being held by his mother with the two grandmothers also in the picture. And then there's this blank space. And I'm saying, Lucky Lindbergh, Charles, where, where do you be? You know, where's the baby's daddy? So what inspired me to start thinking about babies gone missing was not only um, as a linguist, I just love the phrase gone missing just resonates for me in a particular kind of way. But also it was an image that I saw that got me into this book. So don't let it be only, you don't only need to read to know what to write. Um, you can, um, Toni Morrison said, just see the world and remember it in your head. You don't even need the photographs. At one time she stopped taking pictures. She said she just wanted to have these memories in her head. So call up the picture file of the things that you have seen and the things that have given you pause. And I'm gonna move to the next one. So someone, I don't know if anyone here has done an MFA program. I did I'm personally not a fan of the one I went to. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's a whole other panel. So that we can get into. Um, but this person is doing an MFA and they were set on not creative nonfiction. And after listening to all of you, uh, they feel that they can do fiction and historical fiction, which they're also a big fan of. Uh, so they're asking about if you know of any MFA programs that you would recommend where a Black woman can feel seen and heard. Huh, wow. I only know the one that I went to, which was um, UW Madison, and uh, it, it was a it was a very good. It, it's very very small. They only have like six. There's only six of you, so um, yeah, that's that's interesting. I don't I don't really know. I mean, I did go to one, but I don't really know that much about them, as, about different programs except for for that one. I liked it because it was so small. And and for the size that it was, it, you know, there, it was it was all right in terms of um, representation and stuff. And and I I enjoyed it that way. It was a lot of um, I don't know. You get very close to people probably in a different way when it's when there's only six of you. <laughs> so I it was good for me. So yeah, I I would recommend that. But that's based on very limited knowledge of of any other MFA program really and what it's like to go through it. Yeah. And someone gave a, a recommendation in the chat of Stone Coast at the University of Southern Maine. Um, I, I don't know that one, but my recommendation would be to look at the faculty. Uh, yeah. There's no guarantee yeah. in any way, shape That's or form true. that you will have a great experience across the lines. But I think it's really important to see the faculty uh, understand, and to Lady's point, understand the cohort size, because that yeah. might matter. And also the location mm -hmm. uh, and whether you can afford it. <laughs> I think that's very, very important because, you know, starving artists is a thing and that's real. So I, I have a recommendation. I mean, my yeah. recommendation is the program I went to, which was Wilkes, mm -hmm. the Wilkes um, University MFA program. I enjoyed it tremendously because, um, you know, at the time, you know, I was a working mom and, and all of that. And I didn't have time to go off to a cabin and, you know, with a roaring fire and, and mountain tops and stuff like that. So it was, um, it's a low residency program. But I think what I loved about it the most um, is the faculty. You know, they were all working writers. You know, they were in the trenches. It wasn't, you wouldn't have a professor who's, you know, published something 55 years ago and is in an ivory tower. These faculty are, you know, on the ground with you. Um, and, and I think um, it, it was a very supportive environment. I think um, many of their folks have gone on to do well. Marlon James, who you may have heard of, he is also a, a Wilkes MFA graduate. And, you know, it, it's, it's a small school, but um, size is, it, the size of the cohorts was just right, I think. And, but more importantly, the, the environment of, 
you know, walking the walk and talking the talk. So you had faculty faculty who were, you know, really in there with you. My my uh, mentor, uh, supervisor, uh, supervisory faculty was Robert Mooney. And he actually ended up being my editor for Creatures of Passage. And that's because we had such a close relationship. We kind of could finish each other's sentences and so I think if you're looking for a, a unique um, hands-on, um, you know, do doing, not just saying, but doing type of program, Wilkes would be definitely the one to look at. And so the next question I think is gonna cover two questions because it's about process. Uh, so any of the panelists, if you would like to share um, how much of your novels were mapped out with pre-writing or character sketches versus allowing the story to fold organically. And if you do do outlines or anything like that, is that does that tend to be part of your process in general? I can answer quickly to say no, no, no. <laughs> it, probably, it might show, but um, mine is organic an organic process. I don't map out and I don't have outlines. It can get you into trouble later on when you need to have something fit something else. And so there is work you have to do for consistency. But for me, the process is to just get it out. Yeah, I agree with that. I, I don't do outlines. I, I think that would drive me crazy, you know, an outline. It's very organic for me. It's like painting. I do work on different parts of the novel at once. So I'm like, oh, I'm, on this page, I have this. And in this chapter, I have that. So I just kind of paint it out like a big mural in my mind until it looks like the way I imagined or hoped it would look at the end. I am. Um... I don't work with, I can't do, I think it's because uh, I don't know what I'm writing about <laughs> until I'm done. So I don't know, I don't work with outlines either. But I, I will say that that structure, trying to figure out a way to structure um, stories or novels, it, it takes up a lot of my time. It's, it's, so I can't, I can't really work and at different parts in the, it's like I have to figure out from the beginning where it's going. And so it winds up taking a lot of the process is actually trying to figure out the um, structure, like how to weave things that interest me together in a particular way. So it is, it, it is like finding the shape is, is a big part of the um, process for me of writing it. Yeah. For me, part of the, the challenge was um, at one point, somebody had to know something before somebody else did. and. Right how many days would the US mail take for them to know something? And when did they have to mail it? You know, So that kind of detail, I, I literally dislike intently, but I knew I had to get that accurate to have. We talked earlier about credibility. So that's where I wanted the credibility to be the other parts. I agree with my co-panelists totally, but you will find times when you have to make things make sense in order to keep a reader with you because they'll stop you like on a TV show last night. I said, how come that woman didn't die? I fell all the way out of the sinkhole in LA and she like, you know, so don't lose the reader with a mistake that you could fix with a quick fix, you know, just tell. And one of the things I've learned from fiction, you don't have to tell everything. You could just say, and on the next page, this is what happened. And the reader will, if they trust you, will go along. That's very lovely. And it was Troy Johnson that I wanted to thank from AALBC. Yeah. He has, his support early on made me think, oh, maybe I am a writer. He was the one who made me think I'm a writer. So Troy, wherever you are in this universe, you're my heart. I love Troy, he was great, he was great. Um, so if we can, we'll try two, but I think we'll do one more. So someone's asking, your advice on where to build a writing community with other Black women, whether virtually or, again, we're all in separate places, I, I assume. I know for fact for some of us, but <laughs> for some of us. So I don't know if you have any distinct recommendations or maybe it's going back to um, MFAs or not MFAs or whatnot. But I think they're very specific and looking for Black women. 
writer community? Probably the book clubs. I think that's that's one source. And I found that they kind of find, we kind of find each other um, depending on, um, you know, the venue or sometimes it's by accident or sometimes it's around a topic. Um, but a, a lot of times I think we tend to find each other based on a, a common interest or a common desire to talk about something. Like how we're talking about Black women writers at work tonight. Um, it's it's a it's a way that we find each other. But I think um, I've had um, very positive experiences um, with with some members from book clubs and also from um, especially from faculty, Black women faculty at universities. Um, so it just kind of depends. But it seems like we we somehow find each other. <laughs> And I think I could get to that last one. Do any of you deal with writer's block or believe in writer's block? Some people don't believe in it uh, as a thing. And what happened? How do you feel unstuck? I paint. Not very good painting, <laughs> but, but um, I've taken to painting. Um, I tried sculpting, that was even worse, but but what you're trying to do is something creative. And if it's like trying to fall asleep at night when you can't, you're supposed to get up and do something else. So I think, I don't like the phrase writer's block. I just think you haven't finished thinking about something yet. So you need to create a space where you can think about it, where you don't feel compelled to, and I have to write 500 words about it. So mm. give yourself a space of thinking that doesn't need the production of the page. And I believe that is, you know, writer's space more than writer's block. Absolutely. I couldn't agree with you more on that. <laughs> yeah, there's no such thing as writer's block. It just means something's not working or you need to think about something a little bit more and come back to it. Yes. Yeah, yeah I, I agree as well. I usually, if I, it's because I need to, I'm trying to figure something out, how to do something, and I'm not sure of what, what it is I actually want to do or what feels right. It doesn't feel right when I write something, and that, that's what it is. So I tend to just keep writing, though. So it's probably, probably be healthier for me to go paint and relax for a little, you know what I mean? Like, <laughs> <laughs> might be more productive for me to do that but I tend to just keep writing until I figure things out though but yeah no I don't I, I don't really believe in that concept either so so you also you know like for anyone who might be blocked that may be what it is you need to go paint and sculpt or have like a Patrick Swayze Demi Moore moment <laughs> some, something <I> <laughs> <laughs> So thank you so much, Carla, Lady, Marwa. I It was the absolute biggest pleasure to read all of your books and be in company with you all this evening as we head into the weekend. Uh, no, it's Thursday, Never mind. So, <laughs> so, so thank you. And thank you so much to the Center for Black Literature. You all are so important to everything about the diaspora and always here to support us. So thank you for hosting and thank you all for being here. And I think Clarence is gonna come on to close us out. Thank you, Jennifer. Again, as Jennifer said, thank you very much, Maroa. Thank you, lady. Thank you, Carla. Thank you, Diane of the Harlem Writers Guild. I wanna thank Dr. Green for helping us put this all together. I wanna to thank our staff, uh, as Dr. Green's mentioned, the Center for Black Literature staff. I wanna thank our supporters. As we mentioned, AALBC, I'd also like for everyone to please uh, look at the uh, poll that we're gonna put up at the, that's come up on the screen. So if you can please respond to that, we'd really appreciate it. I wanna say that this has been a really rich conversation and I was really glad to see all you lovely ladies out there because I mean, and, and the questions, they're still coming in. So this we could go on for a whole nother hour. <laughs> I mean, the questions are still coming in. And so this is amazing. This is absolutely amazing. But um, and probably we, hopefully we can do this again. We can continue. But I would uh, encourage everyone to please visit our website, centerforblackliterature.org, to keep abreast of our upcoming programs. 
We have another John Oliver Clinton's reading program coming up on October 14th. And we will continue with uh, Black women writers. We're gonna be featured Daniel Evans and Nicole, Jocelyn Nicole Johnson. Those are the authors of My Monticello and the Office of Historical Corrections. So I advise everyone, or I encourage everyone to please visit our website and to um, continue following us on social media. And also, if you've enjoyed our programs, uh, please donate, make a donation to the Center for Black Literature. All our programs are free and open to the public. So visit our website page and click the donate button. I wanna thank our audience for attending. And again, ladies, I can't thank you enough. I really, I've really enjoyed this. Such a rich conversation. I wanna thank everyone for coming. Have a very pleasant evening, a very safe weekend and enjoy yourselves. Take care, everybody.